pray. Amen. want to sing a lot more, we could always come a little earlier instead of starting late. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to start in Isaiah. The fourth chapter. Chapter four of Isaiah. Looking at this chapter, chapter 4, there's more information that came in concerning seven women to one man. There's, uh, there's been all kinds of different revelation about it. And I know it can, it can be used trying to relate to this generation as well, what's happening, because what's actually, this is pertaining to the nation of Israel, and what pertains to the nation of Israel is also affects the world as well, because that same spirit that's in the world is affecting Israel in the same way. But first of all, we have to look at chapter 4 to find out where is it in time, who does it pertain to? And is there things that we can see a little bit clearer of the picture that God, that really what the word really spells out here in, in Isaiah. And in that fourth chapter, it says in verse 1, In that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our bread, and we will wear our own apparel. Now we read those words, but those words actually pertain to something of the Jewish culture that they had in the Old Testament. But before we get to that part there, I want to bring to the area where this particular time frame that in that day those seven women is going to take a hold of one man. If it's a man of the world today, oh, he says, great, seven women to one man. But I have to say, son, you don't know what you're getting into. <laughs> All right. It says, only let us be called by thy name and take away our reproach. Why were they reproached? So why did they want to eat their own bread, close themselves, and at the same time, they want to take away a reproach from them? These are women at a certain period of time that God is, going to, is talking about here. It says, in that day, the branch of the Lord, and I know we've touched on this in time past, concerning the branch of the Lord, shall be beautiful and glorious. And in days of old or in times past, we always looked upon as the branch of the Lord. If it was a big B in other scriptures, it's referring to Jesus Christ. But here it is not referring to Jesus Christ. Some may argue, oh, it is, but I have to say it ain't. If you read the rest of the scripture, we're going to see where this branch of the Lord really fits. It says, and in that day, the branch of the Lord. What is a branch to begin with? It's something that comes off of a tree, doesn't it? It's an offering or a growth of. And Jesus is 
a growth of you unto of the Lord Jesus of God when he brought him as the branch, which is the big B on the word branch and of the Lord. But this branch here is in a small figure, and actually we're going to see it is the branch of the nation of Israel we're going to be looking at. But the branch of Israel being a nation, it's not in 1948 that it's referring to that we're looking at this morning, because we'll see where it belongs to. And the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Well, so that pertains to Jesus Christ. Yes, he was, he was also beautiful and glorious. But it says here, But beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely. For them, not singular, not for him, but for them, right there is one clue showing us it is not pertaining to Jesus Christ. But it is definitely pertaining to the nation of Israel. That's, comely, that's excellent and comely of them that are escaped of Israel. I don't know about you, but when Jesus walked on the earth, he didn't need to escape anybody. Yes, sometimes he would move out of, out of the presence where the, the throng was trying to, to get at him, but he never went and fleed from Israel. Well, you say, Brother Fred, he did when he was young, when he was a baby, when they went to Egypt. Well, we're not talking about that time there. We're talking about them, which makes it plural. So when would these, this branch that God calls beautiful and glorious, at what time is it go, that branch is going to escape out of Israel? It was not at the time of Jesus' first coming. Because the Jews that went out after Jesus prophesied concerning the temple shall not, shall not stand, not one stone shall be left upon another. The Jews, yes, there was a small element that came in to the bride of Christ that was sealed with the Holy Spirit. But as far as the nation, because we're talking about the nation, not individuals, that nation went out and was, if you want to, surrounded by Titus in 69 AD, and that whole nation was dispersed among all the nations all over the world. And so that branch was not glorious, because the reason it's not glorious, did they not accept Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son that came to them. So it's not speaking about the time when Jesus first came. But it is speaking of a time where there's going to be a branch that's going to be glorious. And you will find that to be right here when the week of Daniel begins. Because God now again is going to send two prophets with the anointing of Moses and Elijah. And when we talk about the spirit of Moses and Elijah... These two prophets, when they do come on the scene, yes, they're going to prophesy. Prophesy in the miracle sense. But there's also prophecy to reveal things as well. Because when I read Joel chapter 2 and 23... In the first month, God promised the former rain and the latter rain to an element of people. And then Joel talks about, when you get into a 23rd verse, he talks about, I have gave them the former rain moderately past tense. I have gave means past tense time. That was in the, in the days when Jesus came at the day of Pentecost. He gave them the rain moderately. But he says, I will send the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And when God dropped that revelation in around 2009, no, it wasn't in 63, no, it wasn't in 2004. When we 
come to understand that first month belongs to the week of Daniel. First of all, who's the promise to? To us Gentiles? No. And we know that the Jewish clock has stopped when Jesus, when Jesus was cut off concerning to the, uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel. And so therefore, God would only deal with the Jews once again when that 70th week would start. And when that 70th week would start, we know it's when that Pope signs the Antichrist, that signs the Antichrist signs it with the covenant with the nations. So in that first month, that's when these two prophets appear. Now some say, well, I can see the, fo- the uh, latter rain, which is the power rain, which is the anointing and the miracles that these two prophets are going to do under the three trumpets that's found in the book of Revelation. But just saying, turning water to blood and, and causing uh, all these things that these two prophets are going to bring on Israel in that first half of the week does not revelate one Jew concerning who Jesus Christ is. So I have to say one of those prophets that's there, his prophecy will be bringing truth to the 144,000 at that hour and not before the week. Otherwise, I'd say, Lord, you made a mistake. That former rain should have been before the week started somewhere. So he could seal the 144,000, but it wasn't. The Bible talks about in the first month of that 70th or last period of time, which is a seven-year period of time. So now that we've got the place established, that that branch that God's talking about is in that first half of the week. That's where the Jews will see the Messiah. And they'll cry when they see a vision of Jesus with a nail-scarred hand in his, nail-scarred in his hands. And they'll weep. And they'll know who the Messiah is. So the, and so the 144,000, they're going to be sealed with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said so. The woman's not sealed, but she believes the message also. God has opened up the understanding of these, of the 144,000 and the woman. How big will the woman Israel be at that hour? Right now. And Israel's only got half their territory. There's 7 million Jews almost in the land. Total Jews worldwide is about 14.2 million Jews. By the time we come to the week, it could reach 15. I'm not here to, to argue numbers with you. But I'm just saying that's how the account of the, the amount of Jews that there is available worldwide. Now as we come into that part of the week here, These 144,000 are going to be sealed. They're the branch. The woman is the branch. Part of that branch that is beautiful to who? To the world? No. To God. Because he has sent two prophets to seal them. And the end result is when he's talking about that beautiful branch. It's going to have to escape out of Israel. We know by revelation that the woman flees to America, to the great wilderness. And we know the wilderness is not in Petro, it is only about 80 miles away from Jerusalem. An attack gunship can sure make a mess of the rest of the Jews they went to hide there in, in, in that place. There's a desert not too far from Israel. But, she can't, but the Antichrist can't reach her if she flees to America. America's that great wilderness. During the, uh, dark, the Middle Ages, or what, coming out of the uh, time of the Reformation, when the Europeans wanted to come to, the, to uh, North America and discover America, America was considered the great wilderness. So that's where that woman flees to. And when she does flee, that fulfills that scripture here, the part where he says, In verse 2, And in that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. 
by. But this has nothing to do with verse 1. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man. When does that come into play? When that woman flees and she goes to America. The 144,000, they're going to flee from once the nation they've come because they have a mission that God has prepared them. That's why God revelated them so they can go out and warn the secular Jews that holds for the word of God and as well as the foolish virgin. And I know you've all heard this already, but we're going to get into something this morning that maybe you didn't see. So as the 144,000 go forth, now, that branch that God calls a branch. Now, the 144,000 and the woman is of the same is the branch, same branch that God's speaking about here in Isaiah. But now, as we read on, and it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion. In Israel, Jerusalem, after that woman has fleed, after that branch has gone forth, that he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, but under what condition though? Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. And when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion... So when is God going to wash the filth away from the daughters of Zion? He's doing it by revelation to the woman as far as their sin concerning not accepting the Messiah. But you have some Orthodox Jews that are still in the land. Now remember, those Orthodox Jews are well acquainted with the two prophets. They're probably well acquainted with those that are going to their meetings and so forth at 144,000. But those Orthodox Jews, as far as God's concerned, they are still filthy in some of the things they have allowed and they're into their, the revelation that they carry. Even the Jews today, they, don't, they say they believe the Torah, but they only believe it as much as they understand it. And the reason they can't understand too far of it, because they don't have the New Testament and what God has revealed in this hour concerning them. So now, here it talks about here. And I'll wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion. Who's the daughters of Zion to begin with? Huh? The daughters of Jerusalem. It's those that live in Jerusalem. It was known at that time there was a bit of friction between the center part of the city of Jerusalem and the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. And so those that lived on the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem, they were considered as the daughters of, of Zion. But those that lived within the immediate area of the temple in the pro Jerusalem proper, proper were called the daughters of Jerusalem. I know we sing that song, the daughters of Jerusalem, concerning other things, but scripturally here, or in the Bible, that's what it's pertaining to. In one sense, if you want to connect it spiritually, we're, we're the daughters of Jerusalem in the sense we're of faith, but the Bible's really referring to those on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Now it says here, And from the midst of them, by the spirit of judgment. So God's going to wash away their filth by the spirit of judgment. So what judgment is God going to administer at that hour? They're going to go, for one thing, through the great tribulation in the last three half, half years. And how is he going to wash away that filth? By judgment. When God judges things, usually there's loss of lives involved. And one of the places that's going to be that judgment to wash away the filth of those Orthodox Jews 
Because remember, when the Pope comes in, he sits in the middle of that temple. He, sorry, he sits in the temple. When, he, when Israel signed the covenant, the Orthodox Jews didn't think too, too much of it or they wasn't really over perturbed with it. And first of all, like we were talking in the Bible study concerning the Shekinah glory of God being in the temple of that first temple, and it left, it left, it, when it left, it was never to return till the time of the millennium, that's in, which is Christ is a type of the Shekinah glory coming back in its permanent form. Now, there's other thing we can bring into that, but I'm just putting it briefly at the, the two boundaries. So when that third temple was built, even when the second temple was built, that high priest offered the blood and went into the holies of holy, but that Shekinah glory was not on the, on the, uh, on the ark that was there. Uh, they didn't have the ark. In, in the holies of holy, there was no, no presence of God there. Because if there was, some priests might have lost their lives. I'm saying all that to say this. When that Antichrist comes and sits in a temple in the holies of holy, showing himself as God, if the presence of God was there, he'd be toast. God would kill him immediately. So therefore, the presence of God is not in the building yet. But think about it now. Here's the Jews from back here. Uh, from after the miracle war, the temple is built. From the time the temple is built, they will start animal sacrifice again. They will dedicate that, that third temple. They'll be going in there doing, doing their administration and the high priest going in there to offer the ho in to the holies of holies. But from that point on, the secular Jews, the Orthodox Jews, not secular, the Orthodox Jews that are believing in the Torah and trying to keep the word of God as, of the Old Testament, because there's Jews in the land of Israel that just don't care one way or the other, just like we have people in our nations too. But when that Pope comes in the middle of the week, and he goes in and sits in that temple because he's got a military might with him. And he's got the agreement of all the ten horns. Actually, the head and the body of the beast has already been joined. That fourth empire that Daniel saw now is in full bloom. He's saying peace in the first half, but he don't like those two prophets. And so he comes into the week in the middle of the week. And he kills those two prophets. And God raises them up in the sight of the whole world to see that God was really displeased with it. Now to the Orthodox Jews, they don't, they see these two men doing these things, but it don't change them. But what does get them upset is when that Pope sits in that holies of holy, now those Orthodox Jews says, it can't be a Gentile sitting there, in there, because it defiles the temple. And so your Orthodox Jews that are in the land not one or two, but a bunch of them is going to get upset. They're going to get mad. So that's why when the Antichrist comes in and he kills the two prophets, now he's got these Orthodox Jews that are causing an uproar. And God says, and and I'll wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have, shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place on Mount Zion and upon her assembly and a cloud of smoke by day and shining flame, fire by night, and upon all glory shall be a, a defense. Now it goes on to speaking when it's going to be later on as it goes into the actual millennium where Jesus is going to be going into the temple. But the whole thing is, here God said he's going to create a judgment. He's not going to judge the woman, and he's not judging the 144,000. Now these Orthodox Jews, 
They see that Pope sitting there in that temple in the Holy of Holy, and they are mad. And the Antichrist, he's got the whole army of the B system, the Europe and the Middle East. And he goes at them. And then if we want to turn now this morning to Zechariah chapter 13. in Zechariah chapter 13 verse 8 and it shall come to pass when right here from the middle of the week that all that in all the lands of the Lord two parts thereof shall be cut off and die But a third shall be left therein. This scripture goes hand in hand with Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 and verse 4. It is the same setting. But here's the whole thing. Whatever's left, two-thirds is going to be slain. We read, we, read, we read the word, two-thirds going to be killed. Oh, yeah, it's two-thirds. But do you ever stop for a moment to think how much two-thirds going to be? Huh? By the time that miracle war is finished, Israel takes all her land, now all the rest of those ten tribes are coming home and let, for this, now some is going to just pick it, pick it bones for, for, for numbers. But I'm just using a relative term here. Let's say there's between 12 to 14 million Jews now in the land by the time the week begins. In the first half of the week, the 140,000 and the woman might amount to 2 million people that's going to flee to North America. So that leaves you about 12 million Jews, right? Or 10, let's say 10. Let's say 4 million goes. It's a small portion. Not, it's just a, a minority, just like it's always been down through time God, when God calls people. How much is two-thirds of 10 million? 6 million Jews. It's going to be slaughtered here at this time. That will be about the same amount as those that were killed in World War II. It says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, Wait a little season till your fellow brethren be killed like you were. We read that, but we never dawned that it's going to be just as many as there was back then. Now, what repercussion does this hall has to do? And, and I know we've looked at scriptures concerning the ten horns will hate the, the whore, and they'll try to tear her down. Well, when you come into a country and you kill six million of their population, that's going to cause a great upset in a world conditions. The ten horns are watching her. Then no longer he starts, he's finished there. He can't get the 140,000. Now he's looking into his territory and he's going killing there. And sometime in our mind, oh, maybe he might be killing five or six or, or seven or eight. No, it's going to be a whole lot. So now the ten horns, which are men of the world that are political and economical, they say, wait a minute, you're causing that peace that you claim. Now there's quite such a disruption. They take and they strip the Catholic Church from him. Now that Antichrist, he's the leader of the church, but he's also the leader of the empire. When we talk about the beast, the beast is not the church. 
the beast is the empire, which is the military. He's got his still, he's still the chief of the military. Economics, he can do what he will. And you know why he can go kill them like he wanted? Because in Revelation chapter 13, round verse 14 and 15, he made a charter with them. And the charter is in Revelation chapter 13. As many who would not receive the mark should be killed. He probably put that in fine print. Nobody could buy except they partake of the system. And here's some troublemakers, and you've heard it in the world today. Ah, oh, religion. That's what causes wars. We're so sick of these ISIS and Al-Qaeda and, and between the, the Protestant and the Catholic and they had in Ireland, different things. These just create confusion and wars. So we want something in our agreement to stop that craziness. So if any bunch rises up like that, we want the rights to kill them. The mark of the beast is enforced from the middle of the week on. And he will enforce it. It starts with the two prophets. Oh my. Now we're into something. Well, so he's going to kill two-thirds of the Jews starting out. So when he does that, and he goes into his territory and he kills a certain a large amount, disrupting the nations within the empire of the beast, old China, been waiting. That old beast took most of the oil that, that could help us grow in our economy. And I see them in disarray now. And they'll say to themselves, if there's ever a time to attack, now's the time. You don't attack in 24 hours. So there's a buildup of the military and things in movement. As they would get ready to move towards the Roman Empire, revised Roman Empire, and we know the head of the battle happens in Israel in, in the Battle of Armageddon. So that's why when the Antichrist goes in killing, the, especially now we're talking this morning about the Jews here, but when he goes with the Gentile, he's not going to be doing that all the way through till Armageddon. When Armageddon is a greater threat to him than some radical religious people. So somewhere during, let's say, halfway through here, as he sees the buildup from China and something's coming his way, he's going to turn his focus that way there. All right. Now, the message is about seven women to one man. Now we're going to go to it. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 4. In actuality, chapter 3 is God's description of society leading up to that hour. How the ring and those jewelry and all these things, people being arrayed and how the children will be their oppressors and so forth. Isn't that the children rule the home in the secular world most of the time? That you didn't have children ruling the roost in the days of Abraham or Moses or in King David. But in the hour that we live in today, this it is. Some kids get to the, to the place where if they know enough, I'm going to sue you parents because you're not letting me, I'm supposed to have a certain amount of freedom, you know. You want freedom? There's the door. Tough love, sometimes it takes the tough love. You can't love them to, to death so they get spoiled when they have to go out in the world. Now, I shouldn't get on that subject. We're going the wrong way. But when we come down where he's talking about the conditions, how people is out looking towards themselves, we reach to verse 25, and it says, Thy men shall fall by the sword, thy mighty men in the war, and her gate shall be lamented and mourned, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. 
that's right here in this period of time. Right from the middle of the week. They shall fall by the sword. Whose sword? The Antichrist's sword. Your mighty men, those that, with the Orthodox Jews that will come in opposition trying to, to rebel or against that Pope sitting there in that temple, they're going to all going to fall. And her gates will be lamented. And she be desolate, she be sit on the ground, and she has come to naught. This goes along with that verse a little, little later on where God says, I have sent the spirit of judgment. How is he going to judgment? He's going to have that Antichrist put the sword to them. Their mighty man is not going to be a match for that Pope with that army that he's got. And so they'll be put down to the ground. All And now in the Jewish society, it is the men that stands up for the word of God. Orthodox Jews, their women are in subjection to their husband. And there's another subject that we can get on. Not dictators over their wives, but they should be in a certain respect of their, of their head. So, I can only go so far for this morning. Not saying I won't touch things later on. Now, here's six million slaughtered in this period of time. And it's the men of war that's going to be fighting, so that's who he's going to be killing, the majority. So you're going to leave a lot, a whole lot of women in Israel compared to men. When nations go to war now, yeah, it's different than our day, but in World War II, they didn't send the women out, they send the men out to do the fighting. The woman did the backup and other things that needed to supply the armies and so forth. Oh, but Brother Fred, there was one. What's one compared to a million? Just thought I'd speak to the critic. So now you have a condition. There's a whole lot of women now existing at this point in time. Now we have to look at the Jewish society, the Orthodox society. Why, would they, why do they act the way they do? Because I remember when I was traveling, going through the airport in New York, there's a lot of Jews there. Their wives are in sub subjection, their children too. My, she said, well, wow, okay. I knew it was a Jew because he wore the cap. And they dress, and there's that respect. I seen it behaving when I was waiting in the airport. So all this boils down to, we have to go to the origin of things. What is the purpose for a woman, or a man, if you want to, in that sense? It stems from the beginning when God told Adam and Eve, go and replenish the earth, which is a commandment hanging over man's head. Now, the earth is pretty well replenished, but I mean... So from there, and we, there's a, well, if you want it, it's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. There's also Jap, Ch Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. God reinitiate, re no, speaks again concerning that condition under the days of Noah. He said, go and replenish the earth, because the earth was empty then, especially after the flood. But now we go to, Exodus, chapter 21. Now, I know it reads in the Old English, but we'll try to expound it a bit. In chapter 21, verse 10. And if he takes another wife. Oh, but I thought we, they're not supposed to. God, when Jesus came, he says, no, in the beginning, when it was like in Adam and Eve, there was one man and one wife. 
but through the hard hardness of their their uh, their minds, if you want to, or their conditions, God more or less allowed certain things to have more than one wife, but there was conditions for them to have more than one wife that had to be fulfilled. And one of the fulfillment was this. If he takes another if he takes on him another wife, her food and her raiment and her duty of marriage shall not be diminished. In other words, the man had to fulfill, to feed her, to clothe her, was the man's responsibility. So the Jewish society knows that, and even in the Orthodox Jewish society today, it's the man's responsibility to do those things. But when we come to Isaiah now, it says, In that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our bread. Not say, The man, you've got to supply me. And we will wear our own apparel. No, you, don't, you have to buy the clothes for me. So these, there's a condition why they want to say that. And it says, let us be called by the name to take away our reproach. Now how do we view that this morning? The condition in the Orthodox Jews, because they're under the law. The reason that the women wanted to be married and have children is to fulfill, because in the beginning, leading from the days of Abraham or from Adam going down through, they were looking through the women would come that promised seeds. And also, to them, to the Jewish Orthodox Jews, or the Jews of that hour under the law, to be unmarried was, if you want to, looked, was frowned upon. Not that it was disobedient, because you could still be unmarried, or, or whether a man or a woman. But the, the, the whole emphasis laying over them, they wanted to be married. And so these women that has their own bread and so forth, their husbands is dead. Now we have over here, they have wealth, but they have no husband because they've been killed. And so therefore, these women, these Orthodox women, not your secular worldly Jews, because it's not your worldly secular Jews that tried to go against the Antichrist. It was those that held for the word of God that, that were slain. So a lot of the women that, were, that these men were married to, now they find themselves without husband. And so they're approaching those that are left in the land that is at least have some decent, well, we will we'll buy our own bread. We'll buy our own apparel. But only let us be called by thy name. It was an arrangement. There was no marital relationship between the seven women and the one man. They just want to be called that way so they are not found as a reproach concerning the law. Is this polygamy? Well, a marriage is not consumed except there's a relationship, right? That's part of it. But on the other hand, if you're taking someone's name, that is also part of it too. So they're between a rock and a hard place here in how you're looking at this thing. Yes, they took on the man's name. In other words, I used to be, she would say I was called a, well, I've got to be careful what name I've got to use. <laughs> I was called Mrs. R and, and then, and, and now I'm called Mrs. S or, or Mrs. Mrs. J, <laughs> whatever. She's, that's her last name. So she's taken on her last name for that it, she's not as a reproach. Here are these widows, because if you, in Jewish society or even in our society, if there was a whole bunch of widows and they need money to be supported or not, that's, that's looked down upon. Oh, yeah, we'll help them, but uh, 
you know, how man is. They'll help for the first time, but then that's, that's it's over. It's just like these crises we have here of these refugees. All their, all their hearts are going out. They, they put out everything. But uh, what's going to happen two years down the road? Is it going to still be open? You see what I mean? So this period here, these women, technically on paper, yes, they are because they took the name. But as far as the marriage bondage is taking place, no. Now it brings to mind about Solomon. He must have been a rich man. Yeah. He had to, he had to provide for all those thousand wives, their arraignment and everything. Can you, <laughs> I, I, just as a point to laugh a little bit. Solomon's getting dressed in the morning. And then he sees these thousand wives. Well, that's not color-coded right. You should wear this. And the other one should say, no, he's got to wear that. The poor man needed wisdom. He'd be confused. <laughs> but the wisdom that Solomon had was not in the earthly things. It's concerning the word of God, how to bring Judgment and what God required. That's what God was looking at. God was, in one sense, God was not so much in favor of him having a thousand wives. That's where these Mormons go off the, off the scene. They stick to the Old Testament. I'd have to say to the Mormons, don't you know what Jesus said? It was not so in the beginning. And in this condition here, and when that war takes place, can you imagine what's going to be taking place there? Here's seven women. They're married by title on paper. Then there becomes a question in the, in, in the structure of them all. And who's going to do what? <laughs> so that condition that exists there. A lot of things are going to be straightened out when Armageddon hits. And those that makes it through Armageddon is the part that in, in you know, Isaiah talks about those that has their name that they will be out on the other side. Then there's the day of the Lord. The Lord is going to destroy the sinners. I don't care if you're a well-dressed sinner or have a nice little meek outlook to the world. God's looking for a class of people that he wants to populate the millennium with. So by the time the millennium come, this agreement of seven women to one man will not be in existence. First of all, under the law, they could divorce. And God accepted the divorce as long as they remain single. Well, she could go be another man's wife. But, uh, uh, but what I'm trying to say this morning is, here, under the law, I don't know what's going to take place during the, through the, through the uh, Armageddon and, and the day of the Lord. But that agreement, it's either they'll be gone or that agreement will be gone, still fulfilling God's word if God was ever going to use one of them women to populate the millennium with. I don't want to put it so hard, and I don't want to water it down either, but that's not God's way. Just by the way they presented themselves, they says, we will buy our own bread. We will close ourselves. That's contrary to God's word, what he had concerning uh, uh, where a man would take on more than one wife. 
Is that clear enough this morning? So I can see in all of this what's, what's been, as we're looking at the picture more deeply, in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 25, that belongs right here when the Antichrist goes and kills them. Because it's at the time seven women will be having one man. That's where you place verse 25. Also looking at Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8, if two-thirds of whatever is left in the land, God says two-thirds is going to die well, hello, we've gone to school and done mathematic enough. And let's say there's 10 million Jews left in the land by the time of the middle of the week and the woman has fleed. That brings you to about the same number of slain Jews as there was under World War II. There's other things we could bring in, but time's a fleeting. You can bring in Revelation 20 and 4. It talks about those that didn't take the mark or worship the beast. It says, I saw thrones and them that sat upon them. And I saw, saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That brings you account to your, your uh, those that's going to be slain. Here, for the witness of Jesus. That pope can only kill only a quarter part of the earth, not the whole earth. Because a quarter part of the earth is that Roman Empire, that beast that's revived, Europe and the Middle East. And those that were beheaded for the word of God, that's your Jews. Here, they're going to be beheaded. No Jews is going to be beheaded in North America. Huh? And which had not worshipped the beast and his image. Neither received the mark in their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Well, these died for their testimony. They believed what the 144,000 was telling them, because the 144,000 is going to minister to the Jews that for the word of God after the middle of the week and as well as through the foolish virgins when that Antichrist goes on his killing spree. Well, it's not a coincidence that in the middle of the week that Pope that Antichrist that be sitting in Jerusalem is going to be such a devil. In Revelation chapter 12, it says that the accuser of the brethren is thrown down in the middle of the week. Satan and his angels is thrown down. And so if you want hell turned loose and all kinds of spirit taking place and people being riled up, what gets people riled up? Satan can get somewhat agitated so much that you sort of, they're out of their skin, so to speak. So get into a certain frenzy if you want to. And when that hour arrives... There's going to be spirits that will want to kill those Orthodox Jews. And in the territory of the beast, when he goes after those foolish virgins, for a while, that Catholic Church, all the daughters had come back to Mama by the beginning of that week. They're, they're there. These are the tares all bundled together. They're, all, they're the tares that bundled the daughters of that mother harlot. They're all back together. 
So when the Antichrist wants to go kill the foolish virgins in his territory, he can say, you Anglican church. I heard you had some radicals down in, that uh, went awoke from me. Do you know where they are? Baptists. You had some problems there too. Do you know where these people are at? Number, there'd be one way for them to spot where they're at, but at the same time, they'll have things like what they do today, the way they try to find terrorists. These guys are not par participating to the system, but uh, because they're not partici participating to the system, they still have to find them. And so that Baptist preacher will say, oh yeah, there are those uh, down that corner of that section of town over there. So... That's the hour that's facing the world. Do we want to be here for that? No, I don't. We'll be at the wedding supper. And there too. When that angel will show a vision of Jesus with a nail-scarred hand. That's towards, that's in the first half of that 70th week towards the, the end of it. They don't get to see it right off the bat, but they will see that vision will happen towards to confirm what the two prophets has been telling them is what's going to be transpiring. That's why it's, it's also in, in Zechariah. We are with Jesus up here at the wedding supper for seven years. So Jesus is not in two places at once. He's not up here and he's not down here witnessing to the Jews that he's got his nail scars hands in his hands. It's an angelic being that does that. The things that God has allowed us to see in this hour is tremendous. I realize if you're just starting out or basic salvation, this may be a lot of things that's hard to put together. But in time, these, the Spirit of God will help put the picture together for you. Most, some of us have been on the road since the 70s or the uh, late 60s. For you, the picture should be clear. Right? Okay. I wasn't sure if I was going to nod or not. <laughs> uh-huh. I believe as we're getting closer now to a certain... Per There's been a change this year. Things that I've seen taking place. Boom, all of a sudden, people are hungry. Those that God that are bringing in that are hungry. I was just doing one service a week, Brother Ray, before, and I was contented with that. But now it's three or four in the week with these, most of them are Bible studies. So it's one thing to preach something, but then you can only catch so much. But it is on a more personal note when it is on a one-to-one -one basis. I know when in the 80s, when we used to have them here, it was, for me, I liked it because I learned as well with the, with the brothers and sisters that were here. I didn't know everything. Sometimes I'm questioning. Some, God would just open up a picture while we're talking. You didn't know that. I didn't let you know that, did I? But it was. And it was best, beneficial too. So praise God. All right, maybe I set enough for this morning. But here, when he talks about slaying, Two-thirds in Zechariah chapter 13. That's over in this part here. In Isaiah 3.25, that army that will be there at that time, that's when they're going to be decimated at that time. And it'll be at that time where you'll have four women, except for seven women to one man. Why do we need to know this? If we are the friends of God, he said he would give us the Holy Spirit and he would show us things to come or things that's in his word. 
Oh, yeah, we'll read that, but it can't be you. Well, it has to be somebody. Somebody must know what's in this word. And God doesn't give his word, all his word to one man either. You only know up to a part. A preacher's not made a superman in the Bible. There are things you may ask a question, I'll have to tell you, I do not know. Well, what are you doing there preaching? I don't know. <laughs> and yes, I do. I can see why. I can see the things that God has shown and the prophecies that was given to me coming into fulfillment. But it's not something you're going to hang sound. Look, 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 look what I got. You do, you do, you're not doing it for yourself. If any glory is given or any revelation is given, it's God that gave it. It's not mine, it's his. But what he gives, we own it personally, every one of us. Well, praise God. Well, you've been awful good. It's quiet. So praise the Lord. You keep telling me that when we're quiet, that's when we're listening. Well, that's good because I see you're like this and not like this. <laughs> you can be quiet that way too, but praise God. All right, let's just stand at this time. Lord, we thankful, Lord, that you keep leading us on. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you keep us as the apple of thine eye. Lord, we remember thy nation, Israel. And I ask, Lord, you use these words that were spoken this morning as you would see fit. In Christ Jesus' name I pray this morning. Amen. You may see it. Have the musicians to come. Reach out and touch the Lord as He goes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment and need to supply.
when he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as worthy, God as I am. He views me.
Praise the Lord. Let's just stand at this time. Brother Ray, if you'd come and dismiss us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your wonderful love and mercy to us once again. Yes, Heavenly Father, as we dismiss from this building, Father, we just go pray that you would go with each one. Give us traveling mercies. Be with your children this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.